Athenaise went away one morning to visit her parents, 10 miles back on the Bon Dieu River in Louisiana. She did not return in the evening, and Cazot, her husband, was worried. He felt sure that it was because of her lazy brothers. Cazot expressed his worries to his servant, Felicite, who served him dinner. Cazot's eyes were dark blue, narrow, and overshadowed. His hands were coarse and stiff because of farming tools. He handled his fork and knife clumsily. He ate alone by the light of a coal oil lamp. Felicite stood nearby like a restless shadow. She served him with a dish of sunfish fried crisp and brown. There was nothing else set before him beside the bread and butter and the bottle of red wine. Only married two months and she has her head turned already to leave. It is not right, she said. Cazo shrugged his shoulders. Felicite's opinion of his wife's behavior after two months of marriage did not matter to him. He was used to being alone and did not mind a night or two of it. He had lived alone ten years since his first wife died. Cazo stood up and walked outside. The night was beginning to deepen and gather black around the groups of trees in the yard. Far away, he could hear the sound of someone playing an accordion. Nearby, a baby was crying. Cazot's horse was waiting, saddled. He still had much farm work to do before bedtime. He did not have time to think about Athenaise. But he felt her absence like a deep pain. Before he slept that night Cazot was visited by an image of Athenaise's pale, young face with its soft lips and sensual eyes. The marriage had been a mistake. He had only to look into her eyes to feel that, to sense her growing dislike of him. But the marriage could not be undone and he was ready to make the best of it and expected the same effort from her. He would find means to keep her at home hereafter. These sad thoughts kept Kazo awake far into the night. The moon was shining and its pale light reached into the room. It was still outside, with no sound except the distant notes of the accordion. Athenaise did not return the following day, even though her husband sent her a message to do so by her brother, Monticlin, who passed on his way to the village early in the morning. On the third day, Cazo prepared his horse and went himself in search of her. She had sent no word, no message, explaining her absence, and he felt that he had good reason to be offended. Athenaise's parents, the Mishis, lived in a large home owned by a trader who lived in town. The house was far too big for their use. Upstairs, the rooms were so large and empty that they were used for parties. A dance at the Mishi home and a plate of Madame Mishi's soup were pleasures not to be missed. Madame Michi, who had been seated on the gallery in a rocking chair, stood up to greet him as he drew near. She was short and fat with a cheery face. But she was clearly tense as Cazot arrived. Monticlin was there too. But he was not uneasy. He made no effort to hide his dislike of Cazot. Dirty man! He said under his breath as Cazot climbed the stairs to the porch. Monticlin disliked Cazot for refusing to lend him money long ago. Now that this man was his sister's husband, he disliked him even more. Mishi and his oldest son were away. They both respected Cazot and talked highly of him. 
They both loved Kazo. Kazo shook hands with Madame Mishi, who offered him a chair. Athenaise had shut herself in her room. Kazo had seen her rise and enter the house. You know, nothing would do last night, Madame Mishi said. Athenaise just had to stay for a little dance. The boys would not let their sister leave. Kazo shrugged his shoulders to show he knew nothing about last night. Didn't Monteclin tell you we were going to keep Athenaise? she asked. But Monteclin had told him nothing. And how about the night before? asked Kazo. And last night? Do you have dances every night? It isn't possible you dance every night out here on the Bondio. Madame Mishi laughed and told her son to go tell Athenais her husband had arrived. Monteclin did not move. You know as well as I do that it is no use to tell Athenais anything, said Monteclin. You and Pa have been talking to her since Monday. When Athenais said she was not returning to Casso, she meant it. Two fiery red spots rose to Casso's cheeks. What Monteclin said was true. Athenais, upon the first day of her arrival, had announced that she came to stay, having no intention of returning under Casso's roof. It was difficult for her to understand why she had married. Her father had asked her this question a dozen times. Girls were just expected to get married. And she did like Cazo. Monteclin had asked Athenais to explain herself. He had asked her if Cazo abused her or if he drank too much. No. Athenais had said. It is just being married that I hate. I do not like being Mrs. Cazo. I want to be Athenais Mishi again. I do not like living with a man, all his clothing everywhere and his ugly bare feet. At the time, Monteclin had been sorry, his sister had no serious evidence to use against Cazo. And now, there was Cazo himself looking like he wanted to hit Monteclin. Cazo stood up and went inside the house to his wife's room. Athenais, get ready, he said quietly. It is late and we do not have time to lose. Athenais was not prepared for his calm request. She didn't say a word to him. She felt a sense of hopelessness about continuing to rebel against the idea of marriage. She gathered her hat and gloves. Then, she walked downstairs past her brother and mother, got on her horse and rode away. Cazo followed behind her. It was late when they reached home. Cazo once more ate dinner alone. Athenais sat in her room crying. She didn't want to come back. Athenais never wanted to take responsibilities of life. No one understood why she wanted to end such a happy married life. Athenais' parents had hoped that marriage would bring a sense of responsibility so deeply lacking in her character. No one could understand why she so hated her role as wife. Cazo had never spoken angrily to her or called her names or failed to give her everything she wanted. He never drank. He loved her madly and wanted to be with her. His main offense seemed to be that he loved her. And Athenais was not a woman to be loved against her will. At breakfast, Athenais complained to her husband. Why did you have to marry me when there were so many other girls to choose from, she asked. 
And it is strange that if you hate my brother so much, why would you marry his sister? I do not know what any of them have to do with it, Kazo said. I married you because I loved you. I guess I was a fool to think I could make you happy. I do not know what else to do but make the best of a bad deal and shake hands over it. It now seemed to Athenais that her brother was the only friend left to her in the world. Her parents had turned from her and her friends laughed at her. But Monticlin had an idea for securing his sister's freedom. After some thought, Athenais agreed to his plan. The next morning, Kazo woke up to find his wife was gone. She had packed her belongings and left in the night. Kazo felt a terrible sense of loss. It was not new, he had felt it for weeks. But this time he was very upset because she left without informing him. He realized he had missed his chance for happiness. He could not think of loving any other woman and could not imagine Athenais ever caring for him. He wrote her a letter stating that he did not want her back unless she returned of her own free will. Athenais had escaped to the big city of New Orleans. She was staying at a private hotel that Monticlin had chosen and paid to rent for a month. A woman named Sylvie owned the hotel and took good care of Athenais. Athenais soon became friends with Mr. Gouvernail who was also staying at the hotel. This friendship helped her feel less lonely about missing her family. But Mr. Gouvernail soon started to fall in love with Athenais. He knew she was uninformed, unsatisfied, and strong-willed. But he also suspected that she loved her husband, although she did not know it. Bitter as this belief was, he accepted it. Athenais's last week in the city was coming to an end. She had not found a job and was too homesick to stay any longer. Also, she had not been feeling well. She complained in detail about her sickness to Sylvie. Sylvie was very wise, and Athenais was very stupid. Sylvie very calmly explained to Athenais that she was feeling sick because she was pregnant. Athenais could not believe this. Athenais sat very still for a long time thinking about this new information. Her whole being was overcome with a wave of happiness. Then, she stood up, ready to take action. She had to tell her mother and Kazo. As she thought of him, a whole new sense of life swept over her. She could not wait to return to him. The next day Athenais spent traveling home. When she arrived at Kazo's house, he lifted her out of the horse carriage and they held each other tight. They didn't speak a single word. But this time Athenais looked at him with love. There was passion in her eyes. Kazo saw that spark and was happy. He knew that her wife had accepted him with her whole heart. A new love life was going to begin. The country night was warm and still except for a baby crying in the distance. Listen, Kazo, said Athenais. How Juliet's baby is crying. Poor darling, I wonder what is the matter with it.